Good evening. I'm Barbara Matthews, Executive Dean for Culture at Nottingham Trent University. And it's my very real pleasure to welcome you to the opening event of the inaugural Critical Poetics International Summer School. The Critical Poetics Research Group explores the role of creative and critical writing in promoting cross-cultural conversation and driving social change. Throughout the summer school, in partnership with Nottingham Contemporary, Curated and Created MTU and Metronome, we have a programme of public events, workshops, performances and readings, investigating the theme of care in all its contexts. How has the global pandemic changed care? What does care now mean in light of social injustices and inequalities foregrounded by Black Lives Matter? What does it mean to be charged with the care of animal and vegetable life forms during the sixth mass extinction and the care of the environment in the ongoing climate crisis? How has care, both as a concept and an experience, changed for writers, artists, critics and readers? But most importantly, to talk to us about care this evening, we're absolutely delighted to welcome Michael Rosen back to Nottingham Trent. I'll introduce him shortly, and then he will read and talk to us about his latest book, Many Different Kinds of Love, a story of life and death in the NHS. After that, he'll be joined by Sandeep Mahal, director of the Nottingham UNESCO City of Literature, who will chat to Michael and ask him questions on your behalf. Michael Rosen is a very well-loved and widely known writer and performance poet for both children's, children and adults. He's currently professor of children's literature at Goldsmiths, University of London, where he co-devised and teaches an MA in children's literature. He's also, as I'm sure you know, a popular broadcaster and has presented BBC Radio 4's acclaimed programme about language, word of mouth, since 1998, as well as regularly presenting documentary programmes, including the Sony Gold Award winning On Saying Goodbye. Michael has published in the region of 200 books and appears regularly at literary festivals, excuse me, literary festivals all over the UK and in Ireland. He received the Eleanor Fargin Award for his outstanding contribution to children's literature and was children's laureate from 2007 to 2009. And in recognition of his contribution to the profile of French culture in the UK, he was made Chevalier de l'Ordre des Arts et des Lettres. In 2010, Michael was awarded an honorary degree by us, Nottingham Trent University, in recognition of his outstanding contribution to literature and learning and his inspiration to teachers, parents, and children. More recently, in March 2020, Michael contracted COVID-19 and spent seven weeks in intensive care at the Whittington Hospital. His powerful and intensely moving book tells the story of what happened next and the extraordinary care he received from many different quarters. Sandeep Mahal, who will be joining him later, is director for Nottingham UNESCO City of Literature leading the company artistically and strategically to support Nottingham's arts and literary community. She works closely with partner organisations to develop ideas, creative opportunities and ambition to make Nottingham an even more creative place than it is now. She started her career in public libraries before moving to the Reading Agency, where she led a national consortium transforming the way that UK publishes, publishers collaborated with the Public Library Network. She's a Claw Fellow, trustee of the Women's Prize Trust and of Spread the Word, and is currently judging the Discovery Scheme for New Writers and the British Book Industry Awards 2021. So, Michael, welcome. We are very, very delighted you are able to be with us, and now it really is over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara, for that very generous introduction. So, yes, I'm, I'm talking this evening about this book that I've just written called Many Different Kinds of Love. Um, and it tells the story of how I got ill and, um, as far as I know, got to, or am still getting better. Um, so I thought I would do it chronologically, start at the beginning, read you bits, talk my way through it. And then I'm looking forward to hearing the questions from Sandeep afterwards. So I got ill, as you heard, in late March 2020. And in, as is my wont, I started tweeting about it. And on day 12, I wrote, the year's seasons roll by in a night. Sweats, freezes, sweats, freezes. 
wondered whose mouth I had. I didn't remember it as made of sandpaper. Water is as good as ever. So I wrote that on the 27th of March, and I started to uh, feel even worse than that. Uh, found it rather difficult to get to breathe, really. Um, and luckily, we have a neighbour who's a friend and a GP. And uh, by Emma's account, that uh, I started looking very bad and was able to get in touch with Dr. Katie, as we call her. And she came over and later she wrote a letter about what she saw. So I'll share that with you because she wanted to tell me what, what she had actually seen and done. Emma, that's my wife, came down the stairs and said, it's 58. So what she'd done is uh, put the ox oximeter on my finger. So these are the things that test how quickly uh, the, you, your body takes up oxygen. At first, I thought this must be a mistake that maybe Emma had confused this with your pulse, which is also shown on the display. But when she told me that your pulse was 115, 115, I knew there was no mistake. Oxygen saturations are given as a percentage, so have a maximum of 100. A normal level is at least 95%. I'd never seen an oxygen saturation this low in someone conscious. With support, you managed to get down the stairs because what Katie did was uh, ring the A&E at the Whittington and say that I had to get there. Um, but when you got to the bottom, your legs gave way and you sank in a heap at the bottom step, resting your head on your knees. I'll never forget the image of you at the bottom of the stairs, your head and your knees on your knees and your daughter Elsie gently stroking your back and whispering words of encouragement to you. I could see that you were close to, close to collapse and gravely ill and knew I might need to step forward and try and resuscitate you, but without PPE. For some reason, your son Eddie came into my mind at that point. I clearly remember thinking, I cannot let him die. Eddie died, my son died. So um, Emma and Elsie helped you into the car. I called ahead to A&E and spoke to a doctor to make sure they were ready for you and avoid any delays. I could see you were frightened and tried to be reassuring, saying how much better you would feel once they gave you some oxygen at the hospital. You didn't have the strength to lift your head up fully or talk, but gave a slight smile and a thumbs up sign before I shut the door. And so I went off to the hospital and I spent um, a few days where they thought I was getting better and then suddenly I wasn't. And uh, this is what happened. So most of the rest is in the present. A doctor is standing by my bed, asking me if I would sign a piece of paper which would allow them to put me to sleep and pump air into my lungs. Will I wake up, I say. There's a 50-50 chance, he says. If I say no, I say, zero, and I sign. In fact, I remember from that, actually, I did have a little feeling that I was actually, 50-50 sounded quite good, really. I remember thinking, hmm, that's not bad. I think probably because I was short of oxygen and you, and you get this lightheadedness, you know. So under I went, and I was under for 40 days, and the only way I know really what happened during that 40 days, because Emma couldn't come and see me, uh, is what the nurses wrote. So the nurses and um, the other people who were recruited in wrote this. It's, you can see it's called a patient diary. And this is what's stuck to the front of it. And it's just an exercise book. This diary can be completed by relatives, friends, nurses, doctors and allied health professionals to record the patient's daily events. This diary will be given to the patient on discharge from critical care or if appropriate, when recovering on critical care. The diary may help with the patient's post-critical care recovery by providing them with information and insight into a time when they were not aware. So that little phrase, or if appropriate, I think means that, um, meaning if you if you died. And in fact, in my ward, there were 24 of us in what should have been only 11 of us, and 42% of us died in the time that I was in the ward. So I just thought I'd read you the kind of letters that are in there. And in fact, if I show you uh, the, the, the diary, the way it's done is that the nurses, they just write in, in their handwriting. You can see it there. Look, the different nurses have written. And some of them are physios, in fact, and have come across. Some of them are voice therapists and they've come across to help out. And here's Margie. Dear Michael, my name is Margie. I'm one of the nurses who admitted you in the ICU on the 29th. At the time, you only required a CPAP machine, which helped you, and we were able to move you back to the ward. 
On your second ICU admission, you required a ventilator to take over your breathing due to your further deterioration. You required quite a lot of ventilator support. The ICU team had to prone you, meaning you had to lie on your belly to improve your oxygenation. This procedure required seven people to reposition you carefully. The ICU team was so glad to see you improving every day. Your breathing is much better compared to previous days. You're now breathing with less support from the ventilator. Your vital signs are stable also. We're hoping to see you improving every day. Take one day at a time. You'll get there soon. All the best, Michael, Margie, ICU nurse. And so there's about 30 or more of these from the different nurses. Um, I won't, you, they're in the book, you can see, and they're quite remarkable. And then in between, Emma was keeping the family posted. Here's Emma on the 2nd of May. Hi all. Mick, that's what she calls me, is experiencing delirium at the moment, and this is making him quite agitated, hallucinating and moving his, arm, moving his arms and legs around. The doctor asked me for some music last evening, and apparently some Django Reinhardt seemed to soothe him a bit. Elsie and I made a playlist for him this morning, which is now taped up on the wall by his bed, and the staff have already played him some of the tracks. Love to all, Emma. So I'm in that state uh, on my back um, with the tubes coming in and out of me for 40 days. Um, and then they wake me up. And uh, there's a period of about 10 days where I don't really know um, what was going on. Um, a doctor asks me whether I've had hallucinations or nightmares or terrifying delirium. I say no. She says that they're getting reports that people who've been in intensive care are experiencing this and they're troubled by it. Are you? I say no. She says, we gave you a lot of mind changing drugs. So we wouldn't be surprised if you said you were suffering from this. Were you, were you upset or agitated by anything like this? I said that I dream the Christmas Carol and write a new version in my head, then become distressed that I can't write it down. Hmm, she says. I also keep dreaming of a German Christmas party. It's always the same part. I've never been to a German Christmas party, but I'm sitting outside at night in a garden wrapped in blankets, and I know that I can't move my legs. My legs won't move. Someone explains that they throw purple berries into the air. They do it. They throw the berries in the air. And the berries burst with a flash, like little stars. And everyone cheers. Hooray! They tell me the word for the purple berries is Wasbieren. Again, the berries burst in the night sky. Pew! And everyone cheers. I have the dream again and again, I say. Hmm, she says, nothing terrifying. I am disturbed by another dream. I imagine that just before I got ill, I came across a statement, a kind of manifesto from a German farmer. It was a reply to the hate coming from neo-Nazis in his neighbourhood. He comes towards me wearing a stonewashed bib and brace. He stands alongside his 1950s tractor with his family around him. His manifesto tells how we can only go on if we love each other. We have to find many different kinds of love, he says. Love for lovers, love for our children, love for our colleagues, love even for people we don't know. If we don't, we'll destroy ourselves. What makes me sad about this dream is that I keep getting to the point where I'm thinking, where is this manifesto? Who is the farmer? I feel sure he gave it to me before I got ill. How did I get to meet him and his family? Where was it? And then it goes. It's not nightmarish, more a matter of regret that I've lost track of something. Hmm. A nurse tells me every day that Emma has rung and that they're telling her everything. I think of the space between here and home where Emma is. It's only a few streets, but it's a gulf. In that world, I used to get up and make myself breakfast. I'd sit down with Emma and plan what I would do over the next few months. Here, I wait for a meal, and I'm asked if I've opened my bowels. Was it a big one, a medium one, or a small one? I'm ticked off if I lie too far from the centre of the bed. A nurse walks past, singing, no woman, no cry. A doctor stands by my bed and says that I have three blood clots in my lungs. 
I picture three reddish brown scabs stuck in the passageways of my lungs, nestling in the alveoli, little bubble-like cul-de-sacs that I drew for my biology exam when I was 16. She says, blood clots are always a worry because they can get into the bloodstream and cause heart attacks and strokes. I see the scabs heading downstream in my veins, getting stuck in the heart I dissected for biology, or pushing into my brain and killing off a chunk of that cauliflower looking thing. How worried should I be, I say. You'll probably digest them, she says. I remember picking scabs off my knee on camping holidays and eating them. I must have digested them. Emma sends in a furry blanket and a duvet that has a black and white checked cover. At last, my hands and feet are warm. I put my cheek next to the fur or the linen of the duvet cover. I feel safe and strong. Emma is with me here. There's an advert. Yes, there was an advert in underground stations when I was a child. Two small children who we see from behind walking along a long empty road, holding hands, dark trees on either side. The ad line was, children's shoes have far to go. I used to feel sad for the children, so alone, so far from home. I see the ad again and again. You sent in giant yellow sultanas. You know me. Every morning I drop them into the porridge that the nurses bring us. As I sip, I discover the sultanas basking in the deep, swelling in the hot milk, and I nibble them one by one with my front teeth, pushing my tongue against the wrinkles and flesh. The physios, so now what happens is after 10 days or more on the ward, after I've come out of the coma, which I was in for 40 days, uh, I couldn't stand up. I couldn't really move very much at all. Uh, my body had done what's called decondition, so really nothing worked at all. I was just a blob, apart from that I could speak. Um, but I couldn't see out of my left eye and I couldn't hear with my left ear. Um, so I went to a rehab hospital. So after a few days, uh, they were trying to do things for me, to me. The physio said that they're taking me to the gym. Again, I worked myself from the wheelchair to the Zimmer. So I'd already been put in the wheelchair and had heaved myself up onto a Zimmer frame, but that was it. And now onto a padded bench in the gym. They want me to stand up from the bench, pushing with my hands behind me. When I do, I'm gasping. <gasps> I hear my breath roaring in my right ear. They tell me how to breathe in through the nose, deep and slow, out through the mouth, pursed lips. They tell me that I have very low blood pressure and my body doesn't want to stand up or walk. Pedal your feet, they say. Pedal. I think of my heart wanting to take it easy. Every time it comes to the turn of the left ventricle to pump blood round my body, it thinks... Why bother? Let's go back to bed and lie down under the duvet. But the physios want me to use the zimmer to take a step. I grip the zimmer and try to lift my leg. It feels as if I'm asking a blank space to work. My foot shuffles a few inches. The physios are pleased. It feels as if they have expectations way beyond what I'll ever do. I wheel back to the bedside leave her onto the zimmer and back into bed and under the duvet. Emma comes to the gym to watch me walk. I'm getting anxious. I want, her to, I want her to see that yesterday I walked very nearly the whole length of the gym without stopping. She sits on a bit of apparatus and watches. I hear myself panting again. My legs go weak. I'm not going to make it to the wall. I sway and stop. I was better yesterday, I say to her. I hear that I'm pleading. 
I glimpsed myself years ahead, walking ten strides, gasping and stopping. I'm not going to get better, am I? I try to walk to the loo without using Sticky McStick Stick. That's what I called my very functional NHS walking stick they gave me. Um, and so I try to walk to the loo without using Sticky McStick Stick. I stagger. I think of M people, Heather Small. I sing to myself, search for the hero inside yourself. When I get there, I sit on the loo, wondering how many people have sung, search for the hero inside yourself to get themselves to the loo. Hmm, I don't think I know the answer to that question. I know death. I watched my mother die. She sat up in bed, coughed. A nurse jumped forward, caught something that came out of her mouth, and she fell back against the pillows. I went into my son's room early one morning to tell him that I was off out, but he was still and cold and didn't hear me. I rang 999 and they asked me to pull him from the bed and lie him on his side and his arm stuck up in the air, away from his body, not moving. And when he landed on the floor, something came out of his mouth onto the carpet. They asked me to feel for his pulse. There wasn't any. I told them this and they told me he was dead. Later, they put him in a bag. I heard the zip and they slid the bag down the stairs. I realised that I've learned how to walk three times. The first, I guess, was when I was about one living in a flat over a shop with a backyard. I stayed walking every day until I was 17. I got knocked down by a car, spent eight weeks in a hospital in a kind of hammock. They told me to get up and walk. I couldn't. So they sent me to a rehab centre and taught me how to walk in the middle of a field not far from Watford. And then after this COVID stuff, three times. Hmm. Seems a bit excessive. This is to the nurses. Your hands speak. Touch is a language. Each palm, each fingertip is a line from your stories. I get what they each say. This hand is in a hurry. This hand hesitates. These hands are worried. They catch me as I slope sideways. This hand knows a lot. It hunts for the lumps where previous jabs filled me with blood thinner. This, hun this hand hunts for bed sores. It spreads Vaseline and kindness. And then I came home. I came home just over a year ago, in fact, uh, just uh, either yesterday or the day before. I can't quite figure it out. But so I came home exactly a year ago and I started to try and figure out what had happened. And I couldn't, to be honest. Um, in fact, I didn't even know really who I was. So I'll, I'll read you that first. I'm not sure I'm me. I can't see as I used to see. I can't hear as I used to hear my legs feel like cardboard tubes filled with porridge. I'm a traveller who reached the land of the dead. I broke the rule that said I had to stay. I crossed back over the water. I dodged the guard dog. I came out. I've returned. I wander about. I left some things down there. It took bits of me as prisoner, an ear and an eye. They're waiting for me to come back. The ear is listening. The eye is the lookout. So you can see I was trying to piece things together. Um, our daughter tells me that when you talked to me on FaceTime when I was in intensive care, my eyes were open, but I just stared, not speaking, not responding to what you said. I'm getting it that there is a place between life and death. I was there for weeks. In fact, um, Dr. Professor Hugh Montgomery, uh, on a film that was made about intensive care, 
uh, with three of us who were in intensive care, uh, said, it struck me actually, he'd never said it to me on the film. He said, well, he said to the interviewer, we didn't know whether Michael was brain dead or not. <laughs> Uh, because my eye, this left eye, was like kind of staring. You can see maybe that it's dilated, you see. And so they were a bit worried. And then when they clicked in my left ear and I didn't respond, and they did think that I was brain dead. He didn't tell me that. I only noticed it. I only heard that on the film. Years ago, I sat by my children's beds waiting for a fever to go. I'm a parent. It's what we do. The nurses have given me a patient diary. Reading it, I get to realise that as I lay there unconscious, a nurse sat by my bed all night, night after night, talking to me, telling me things, cleaning me, trying to wake me up out of the coma. And then when the long night was over, they sat and wrote me a letter to put in this patient diary. I try to fathom this devotion. They are my parents. And so, um, so I'm at home, busy trying to figure out all these things. Dear children, I got ill. We get ill. You get ill. I'm getting over it. On the mend, people say. I'm doing my best, like you do your best. I don't know how it'll work out. We never know for certain. No, that's the one thing we do know for certain, that we never know for certain. What we always have is now, the moment before the next moment. It's only the next moment we're not sure about. So whatever we've got to do, we have to do it now, in the moment that we have for certain. That's what I'm trying to do. I can see you're doing things too. You're doing them now. That's good. It's the only time you can do them. But you know that anyway. Lots and lots of love, Dad. My teenage son feels that it's his right to punch me if he gets a football score prediction right and I get it wrong. I'm right and you're wrong, he says. What are you? Uh, wrong, I say. What are you, he says. Wrong, I say. Now, the next thing coming up is the punch. I put my hand up. You can't punch me, I say. I'm on blood thinners. If you punch me, you'll bruise me and I'll bleed to death very, very slowly from the inside. It stops him from punching me. What are you, he says. Wrong, I say. Someone posts a tweet saying some of the COVID stories are untrue, lurid, and unnecessarily scare people. I post back. Yeah, I made up my COVID story. In reality, I was hiding under the table. The person replies, of course, I wasn't saying you made up your COVID infection, but you're 74. But you're 74. I think about but. What is but about being 74? Hmm. And then I'll finish with this one. People stop me in the park and say they're glad I'm up and about. I guess it feels to them as if I've postponed death, fending it off for a bit longer. I don't want to be the messenger of false hope, though. I didn't cancel death. It just didn't happen right then. And it is what we all do. Life is postponing death. When I meet people and they say they're glad to see me, I tell them I'm not dead. So I'll finish there for the moment and uh, hand over to Sandeep, uh, Sandeep Mahal. And uh, it's question time, I think. Yes. Michael, thank you so much for that wonderful reading from your beautiful book, Many Different Kinds of Love, A Story of Life, Death and the NHS, a book that um, captures both the shattering experience of falling ill with coronavirus and the collective act of care and tenderness that made your survival possible. I'm so happy you're here with us. Um, so it's absolutely stuffed uh, with material for us to discuss and um, perhaps we could do almost like a um, little bit of a temperature check. <laughs> 
what is your health currently? And maybe you could say what's been improving for you in recent weeks? So this left eye is, uh, I can only describe it as fogged. So something happened as a result of COVID and it may have been micro bleeds in my brain uh, or it may just be the nerve got damaged because COVID is a multi, uh, multi symptomatic uh, illness. It causes, uh, it has effects in all the different parts of the bodily system. So maybe it knocked out my optic nerve, which is damaged. And it also knocked out my auditory nerve. That's the one in the left ear. I have numb toes. Um, I lost my toenails rather mysteriously. I remember looking at my feet and just saw, just to be crude about it, I saw these kind of scabs where there were nails. And um, so I've had the experience of new toenails, which has been quite painful. Um, and then I get dizzy uh, quite a lot. And then I'm still not strong, but uh, I can walk for, I think my record is one hour, 40 minutes, I think. And I can get up Muswell Hill. Um, the dizziness is a bother. And this eye, we're, we're sort of playing around with it uh, because it's also had some glaucoma in it. So eyes, I mean, they're sort of, it's only one tiny part of your body, but of course, you know, we're, we're very much based, our lives are very much based on our eyes if we have them. Um, and so, uh, indeed. So that's the sort of physical rundown. I think that probably covers it. Uh, I am quite fit. I do weights uh, every other day. I have what I call alternate day syndrome. So if I exercise a lot one day, the next day I have to take a kip on the sofa. So it's, it's, quite, it's quite nice in its own way, really. Um, and I have had various other things that I won't bore you with. Oh, well, I think I have that syndrome too, because I'm exactly the same. I, I feel so good once I've done a day of exercise, I give myself a break the next day. And, and uh, I assume you're still in recovery and, and getting treatment uh, for, for the long COVID. Yes, I mean, I think I'll always be recovering. I, 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 people do say, have you recovered? Which is fine. And have you, are you better? And so on. Uh, I'm better than I was, but I think I'm in a state of recovery. I mean, one of the discoveries of this time is that, um, well, in one way or another, we're always all recovering from something. It may be recovering from having a cold, or it may be recovering from a slight that happened when we were young and we remember it every other day. Why did my mum say that to me? Or my dad or whoever it was, my brother, sister, uh, or indeed the, my ex. Um, so you, we say these things, so we recover from those. Um, so I sort of feel that um, I'm in a state where I'm understanding recovery. I think that's how I can put it. Um, and um, it might be on any front. It might be one day, it might be the eye, or it might be my knee, which is a, a bit of a, uh, I was going to swear, I won't. Um, anyway, um, so yeah, so I'm, I am recovering and um, trying to enjoy it. Um, I, I did enjoy kind of getting to the loo for the first time, as you heard, singing in people. Um, and in a way, you ha I had those sort of daily achievements. Now I have to think in sort of, in a different wave formation, the recovering. Yeah, I mean, I think we are all in a perpetual state of recovery, um, be it related to health or work or family adjustments, new challenges, mental health. Um, it's an ongoing thing. Hmm. And I really like what you said there about understanding it. What can we do to better understand and help ourselves through this recovery? Um, I finished reading your book, uh, I mentioned this earlier to you while uh, waiting in a hospital consulting room at uh, Walsall Manor Hospital. And that added um, a greater meaning um, to the many kinds of love and the many kinds of care and emotion that I experienced while reading it. I mean, it's a really powerful book and it feels very much like a manifesto to the type of love you describe and the love and care we show for people that we don't know. So I was thinking about um, that service um, that the health workers give, the love and the care that they give. And I was thinking up about you throughout your, your illness, tweeting you a gentle recovery, and also feeling rather protective of you, Michael, too. I mean, how did you find the energy and concentration to put together this extremely moving book? Uh, well, luckily, um, certain parts of my brain were not affected. It's a bit difficult to describe, but though I, I was getting what people are calling brain fog, so I'll borrow their term, 
which I could only describe as suddenly becoming confused. I mean, we all experience it, but I think I realised in July and August and September that I would have these sort of blots, blotting out of certain things that had happened before I got ill and getting confused by things that people were saying. I remember a whole day trying to remember what a tracheostomy is called. I lay in bed going, what's it called? Is it a brachy, brachy? What's it? It's the brachiostomy. No. So there was sort of, I've had strange episodes in, in July and August. Um, but another part of my brain has been very alert and active. And in fact, I've had some rather strange, almost kind of hyperactive experiences where I've remembered somebody at school and I can almost reach out to them in three dimensions. There's a boy in my primary school and I can see his face and I can see the texture of his skin and even the, the fabric that is, um, we used to wear those funny short trousers in the 1950s. And I can see his trousers and his, and his socks. And I've had lots of very sort of very sharp experiences like that. And that's quite a trigger to writing. Now, the other thing I've found is that I can write. I like writing. I want to write, which I mean, I kind of knew before I got ill, but it's been really, really lovely to, to write. I felt it's something I can do. So every time something occurs to me, I rush over to the computer and get scribbling. And because I'm the kind of person that doesn't have to write a whole story, so I always say this to children, great thing about poems, you can write a poem, it's just about, you know, got four words in it if you want, or 20 words, or if you want, 20,000 words, it's entirely up to you. So I write poems that sometimes, well, you can hear sometimes they're only about 100 words, and there's anything else to say. Um, and so that's been lovely to do that, because it gives me a focus, and it gives me well, I suppose the, the image that comes to me, you know, if you, if these stepping stones, if you've got a river and you've got stepping stones on it, the writing feels like the firm ground so you can get across a river. And um, that's, that's, that's a great relief. It's very nice. It's lovely. And I'm very grateful for that, for you um, documenting your experiences. Um, so I'm giving you and Emma a big virtual Punjabi hug um, for keeping all of us in the Twitter world updated with your progress. Uh, I was, and I'm sure millions of others, were just so very grateful for that and for sharing your experiences um, with us. Um, we see care very early on in the book, um, and you described this to us earlier, where you take us through the realisation of how serious your illness was back in March when your neighbour, um, who is a GP, came round with an oximeter and um, the reading set alarm bells ringing. You arrive at A&E uh, and you went into intensive care straight away and you were in there for 48 days. Um, and it was during that utterly terrifying time, so I'm reading it from the book, that you talk about the delirium, the vivid dreams that um, you had, and it truly sounds terrifying, Michael. You've spoken about the physical uh, effects, after effects of COVID-19, but what has been the emotional impact? Um, it, it, it is terrifying in retrospect. I think I was trying to say that in my own slightly abbreviated way when I said that I saw Hugh Montgomery in the film saying we didn't know whether he was brain dead or not. And I was, I was quite I was sort of horrified, not, not by the fact he said it, but that I didn't realise that was how bad I was. And of course, one of the things about a coma is you genuinely have no idea what it is or what it feels like. When I see that little bit of film, and there's a couple of photographs. And of course, if I watch 24 hours in A&E on the telly and realize I am that person, slack jawed, eyes staring, tubes up my nose, in my mouth, you know, um, at the drip by the side of the bed, I am that person looking quite cadaverous. Um, <laughs> and that, that in a way is sort of horrifying in retrospect, but it, it wasn't at the time. Those dreams that I described, they're more, sad than horrifying so in their own way they're both lovely aren't they the, the dreams the Christmas Carol one was annoying but the one about the Vasbier and there's no such German word by the way I just made that up in my dream and it was lovely it was beautiful the, the, they just exploded in the air these purple berries and then this lovely manifesto about how we've got to love each other what made me sad was that it kept is recurring which of course is one of the things problems are coming out of intensive care is that 
you, you, it's, it's the recurring stuff that's painful. So I would lie in bed and I'd think, oh, here comes that dream again. No, I don't want it. I don't want it. And I couldn't stop it. So that was kind of uncomfortable. I mean, the, the other thing that's been upsetting is, is trying to figure out um, that I am different. I am a different person and trying to figure that out. And obviously people have had accidents, strokes, um, trauma of all sorts of ki all kinds, or, or indeed big events that happen, you know, in the world, you know, we know there are millions of people in war zones and so on, and these are utterly traumatic. Um, so I'm not, not alone in that, but you do become a different person and how you try to figure out what to do about that. And so sometimes I do get a bit distressed about that. I might wake up in the morning and think that I, I wake up thinking I was, I'm, I'm thinking I'm still the person I was before I got ill. And then I realize a few minutes later that I'm not. And that reminds me, sadly, of when my son died, that I would wake up in the morning and think, oh, right, I'll just go and see Eddie. Oh, no, he died. And so um, you have that moment as you're waking up where you misplace yourself. That's what it is. You misplace yourself. And that, that can be quite distressing afterwards. Yeah. So I have to come to terms with all those things. And, and um, you said you're a different person. So there's life before COVID and there's a different life after COVID. And, and I suppose the pandemic has significantly curtailed the way we interact, um, leaving more people increasingly isolated and um, vulnerable. And it's impacted all of us in, in some way or another and magnified inequalities within society uh, and perhaps left more vulnerable groups in society. Um, they've been more disproportionately affected. So how do you think we can lead people through this grief and this stress and sadness and instill a sense of hope? Um, I, I wish I had a magic formula. I, I can only say, uh, try various things. I mean, fundamentally, we only have ourselves. Some people obviously find comfort from uh, prayer and belief in outside powers of one sort or another, uh, external to the human race. I don't do that. So I believe in us, the usness of us. So I have to believe in the people I know and the people I love and hope that they love me. And I really do realize, of course, some people are very alone and don't necessarily have that. So that's very difficult. So that's the sort of bottom line, if you like, which is the humanness of us, for me at any rate. But then on top of that, you, you can't load everything that's going through your mind onto those people or they get fed up with you and walk away, which is, you know, fair enough to a certain extent. They've got their problems. So you can't just keep going, oh, I'm feeling a little bit blue now. Uh, oh, I've got an ache in my right leg because people like that. Well, I invented a character, actually. Um, in Yiddish, there's a word kvetch, and kvetch is to, is to complain. And I invented a Mr. Man character called Mr. Kvetch. And all he can do is kvetch. He can say, oh, my leg, oh, oh no, my neck, I mean, oh, yeah, no, oh, oh, my ear, oh, no, my mouth. One of them, you know, we're all a bit like that. But, you know, Mr. Kvetch is even more like that. So I thought, well, I say in one of the poems, I must not be Mr. Kvetch. So I kind of chastise myself. So what do we do instead? Well, for me, you can see what I do is right. But other people paint, dance, draw, do yoga, uh, make pottery. But I think the making and doing is transformative because what we do when we make and do all these things is we use materials and transform them into things that are ours in some way or another. And the process is always of some form of relief. Now with writing, I would say what it does and I'm not saying it's better than other things because all sorts of other art forms and so on, or indeed gardening, all sorts of things. Is that with writing, if you think of the thoughts and feelings you have in your head as swirling about, things that are held within your head, and if they go on swirling, it becomes painful. It actually sometimes there's a thought. So even the swirling bit's the wrong metaphor. It could be almost like pointed or like a ping pong ball that's banging against the walls inside your brain, inside your skull, I mean, bing, bong, bing, like that. When you find a word for what it is that you're feeling, lonely or sad about yourself or whatever it is, if you find a word to express it, all you have to do is just write that single word down. And then if you think of another word, put another word next to it. 
And you don't have to think about sentences. You can just put school all to one side, that idea that you have to write sentences and you have to write passages and paragraphs and all that stuff. You forget all that. And this is another principle. You just write a word and another word. And then when they, if that's all that comes up, that's fine. And then when you think of another word, you can then start on a new line. And then you can start again on another new line. And it might be three words or five words. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because there's nobody there. There's no kind of sentence police are going to say you're not writing in sentences. And if there are, just banish them because they're a waste of time and a waste of space for you. Well, what, I think you... we've got our case for creativity, why we need more creativity uh, in, in schools and particularly in, ed in education. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was really overwhelmed by the outpouring of love and care on Twitter and, and through reading your book, um, there's a devotion and a kindness and a tenderness that comes with being a health worker. And it's through this very poignant uh, assemblage of diaries kept by the health workers um, who tended your bedside. Uh, and thank you so much for sharing that notebook um, and giving us a glimpse of an entry that we got a real sense um, of, of how you were cared for and how you were cared for by a range of different health workers from different professional backgrounds, from different cultural backgrounds. And I'm just going to mention a few. There was Dan, Ellen, Natasha, Holly, Wincy, Eva, Sarah. Um, Kazia. Katia, yes. Katia, Katia. Yeah. Um, when did you discover uh, their patient diaries and how did it feel when you read them? Right, so... Emma told me that I had the diary and it sat on the kitchen table along with other things that we brought back from hospital, the cards that I received and so on. <laughs> I didn't open it. I didn't. Open, I just looked at it. Here it is. So, so again, so I just kind of looked at it and I didn't open it. And then bit by bit, I would look at it. And I thought it's so long. There's so much of it that they, they wrote all these Oh, it's pouring the rain. And they wrote all these things down about me. And so I sort of struggled with it. And then I found it too overwhelming because part of me didn't want to believe that I was in this, what I call jokerly, the land of the dead. I didn't want to believe that I was that ill. So I, I resisted it. Um, and actually, one of the things that was a breakthrough for me to read it was that when I started writing my stuff, but another one was the fact that to make that film, uh, I was sitting on a park bench, not a park bench, a little garden outside the hospital with Hugh Montgomery. And a woman came past and then she came back again and went, it's Michael, isn't it? And I looked up and I said, yes. And she said, I was, and she started crying. And she said, I was one of the nurses who looked after you. I'm Margie. That's why I read Margie's letter. And I, I got, I, I got overcome as well because she said, oh, it's so wonderful to see you sitting up, you know, I, and so on. And then she went away. And then I just, I know, I, I think it's on the film, I got, I got a bit overcome because I, I can't cope. I couldn't cope then. I can cope now. I couldn't cope with that kind of, well, you know, we know the cliche, kindness of strangers. It's a wonderful cliche. I couldn't cope the fact that she cared. I thought, well, 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 you know, I'm, I'm nothing to her. And yet here she is going, I'm so pleased. And I, I just thought, wow. And I just sort of sat there crying because I couldn't cope with that level of kindness. And also, you know, Margie, I, I know, you know, she's a person of colour, that her background is could be from anywhere in the world, um, for, for, further back, I mean. Um, and um, and many, of the, many of the people, I mean, I got to know the people better in the rehab hospital. And there were people from Brazil, from various of the islands in the Caribbean, from China, from Ireland, um, and they were all just like devoted. And I, I'm sort of, I, sometimes I couldn't cope with it really, because they would say things like, how are you? And you know, I'm thinking, why are you asking me how am I? You know, well, but That's what I found really extraordinary um, is that these health workers were speaking to you while you were absent. Um, yes. And I just think that's the most wonderful thing about literature and care. They wrote their diary entries as if they were having a conversation with you, even though you couldn't answer them back. So the power of care, but also connection uh, through words and using writing to connect with people who are not here. I, mm, no, I mean, really powerful. 
No, I mean, on May the 7th, that's my birthday, um, they stood around my bed and sang me happy birthday. And I presumably, I don't know, was lying there. I do an imitation of myself lying there like that, not even responding. And you're singing to this person. You don't know whether they'll wake up. In fact, they really didn't know. They thought that I might not uh, for one reason or another. Um, and in fact, it was because Emma came in, held my hand. They, they broke the rule, the COVID rules. She came in all masked up and with PPE and so on came in and played recordings of my children in my ear. And apparently this was the game changer because they were just beginning after about 35 days to worry as to whether I really was going to wake up. And um, apparently, according to Hugh, I keep quoting, that the moment I went in the lift, they couldn't stop me talking. I would, I'd sort of, ka -chung! it was almost like a... Uh, you know, back in the room, chung, and um, there I was talking. And so um, from then on, it was, uh, it, it became easier. But before that, as I say, uh, you know, standing around my bed, I've got the entry on my birthday uh, in the book is, you know, and we sang you happy birthday. And then the next day, the person says, yes, and yesterday we sang you happy birthday. And it's like, it's, it's not like ordinary communication, is it? Because it's not me going, yeah, I remember. The next day, it's, um, you know, we had to wash you down today and shave your neck because we're worried that the tracheostomy will get um, septic, you know, or we were suctioning your secretions and all that nice information, which I rather enjoy, actually. And Under Milkwood was played to you. Um, and there was this moment where um, you're, you're sort of making a plan in your head to play cricket with John Agard. And I just, for me, that was a really happy, comforting moment. Mm, yes. Yeah. So the poet John Agard, who uh, comes from Guyana and who I admire enormously and has affected a lot of my writing and performing. And it's just so lovely that I had this dream about him. I don't think I've told him yet, actually. I must tell him. Um, and and um, we're, we're, we're going to have this wonderful writer's cricket match. And then we sit there talking about Michael Holding, you know, who just spoke the other day. Uh, so movingly about terrible racism he's received. And and, and we, I invented this thing, this bowl, this uh, bowl, as you call it, you know, it, when you're bowling, uh, called the doctor. And we, we talk about the doctor. And then I have that dream again and again. And I keep saying, we've got to do this, John. We've got to have this writer's cricket match. Um, so, yes, it's, I'm so pleased that John came into my dream. I mean, I've never met Michael Holding, but anyway, yeah. There's quite an arc of people who cared for you, um, you know, from... I suppose the dishwasher workouts that you were doing in the autumn, um, you were able to accomplish some basic tasks. You were walking to the shop, putting the pots away. Um, I mean, could you give our audience a, a flavour of the different types of health workers that you encountered in the whole of that process? Because there is wow. the depth of the diary entries, but it yeah. goes beyond that as well. Indeed, that's right. So obviously there's different layers of doctors so you have a professor like Hugh Montgomery, but you've got all the different uh, registrars, junior doctors and so on, um, dealing with the different bits of you. And I got a secondary infection uh, in, the, in intensive care. So though I had viral pneumonia from COVID, I then got bacterial pneumonia. So they had to rush in someone who's an expert on bacterial pneumonia. So they slapped me full of antibiotics. So you've got all these different people. And then of course, coming out of hospital, I've had eye doctors, ear doctors, toe doctors, you know, all sorts of people dealing with the different bits of me. But in the hospital, you've got to remember that at that time, because there was such a panic on in March, April, May, there weren't enough intensive care nurses. So the nurses coming in were not, many of them weren't nurses. They were people like voice therapists, um, uh, speech therapists, I should say, speech therapists. Uh, reminding me I should sit up because use my diaphragm because that's what they tell you to do do the exercises move the diaphragm don't speak through your nose um, and so uh, yes the speech therapists there were people who were never been in intensive care awards before who were seeing a, a level of death that possibly you'd never see outside of like a war zone I told you, you know I said 42 percent so there's people who aren't trained to, as it were, deal with that possibility that one minute you might be, as it were, talking or washing someone down or something, and then they just go. Um, and so that's incredible. And then obviously I had nurses when I was on the wards. And then at the rehab hospital, you have a variety of therapists, physiotherapists, 
who are unbelievably well trained. You know, I remember turning to Ashma, uh, who was one of the occupational therapists, and said, you know, what did you do? And she said, I did an MSc. So she, she did her degree, and then she did, you know, a second degree, and there she is saying, catch the balloon, Michael. You know, and I'm going, I can't, I can't, Ashma, can I sit down now? And she's going, just try one more time, just try one. <laughs> so, you know, Ashma is using her MSC because she knows, you know, you've got to use your different muscle blocks around your body. And that, you know, basically the thing we call our core had completely conked. It just was like a blank space. It just it couldn't do it. I couldn't literally, I couldn't throw a balloon, you know. And then she'd say, can you kick a ball? And I'm thinking she's using all that and she's laughing at me and we're having a laugh and so on about different things, laughing at the... The guy who was, in, in fact, she said he was in, been in the Greek army. So his method was very different. It was one, two, three, let's go. So I had kind of Ashma as the soft cop. And I had this guy, I'm terribly sorry, I've forgotten his name, was the kind of hard cop. And I said, you know, I get, I get what you're doing, you guys. I can see, I figured you out, you know. And I said, damn, you found out how we're working. So I had to go to the gym twice a day to learn how to walk. Um, and I say there were all sorts of people. And then people would come in at the weekends. I remember a bloke coming in. And he said, I'm looking after you the weekend. I'm not quite sure what his job was. And he just turned to me at one point. And he said, you're becoming very stick reliant. I said, am I? I said, that's how I'm getting about. And he said, yeah, yeah, but you've got to be less stick reliant if you want to go home. And I thought, oh, weekend guy has told me I've got to be less stick reliant. So, uh, you know, that's when I learned how to throw away the stick. So all these different people came home, district nurses coming to do my tracheostomy scar, uh, tracheostomy wound because it wouldn't heal up. It's another jolly little symptom I have called granulation. There we are, isn't it fun? Um, the skin, my skin's changed. And um, so uh, she came and physios came to the house and asked me what my long-term objectives were. I've written about that in the book. I have. I and have I thought, yeah. long-term objectives. Uh, walk to the Jewish deli on the corner. That would be nice. Anyway, they weren't sure that was a long-term objective. But anyway, they were very kind. And my GP, of course. Uh, so an incredible army of people, wrong militaristic term, but you know what I mean. Yeah, really I mean, the touch points of care were there throughout and continue. And they all knew who you were, Michael. I mean, you're very much someone who is in our public life. To my son, when he was eight, saw you at the South Bank. We're off to see the bear hunt man. You know, you're very much our national treasure. Um, and... You mentioned that a lot of these health workers came, they come from all over the world. We're living in a time of dangerously increasing division. We have this despicable and proven disaster in Dido Harding. This may set your blood pressure to rocket. Um, <laughs> I just want to ask you how you felt when you saw that headline last weekend in the Sunday Times that Dido Harding uh, wants to end the NHS's reliance on foreign workers. How did, it, how did that make you feel? And what would you say to her without swearing? It's that sense, it's, and it goes all the way. I'm old enough to remember Enoch Powell's speech, the Rivers of Blood speech, as it's called. And you ha I have a sense of horror and sickness when I hear stuff like that. You know, I experienced at first hand this unbelievable care, skill, training, knowledge, kindness, love from people, you know, literally either from all over the world or with their origins from all over the world. Uh, I don't really make a distinction. And, and obviously from people who are British born and so on, but just a huge kaleidoscope of, of people. And here was someone deliberately stirring things up because what she was doing, you know, it's, it's a form of, 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 what do we call it, dog whistle. It's a way of trying to herd people into an us and them scenario in which somehow or other that all these people have kept the NHS going since 48 in their many different ways, have been, you know, vital to it. You know, I've heard Diane Abbott talking about her mum coming over and, you know, uh, joining the NHS, of course. And if, well, I, when I was in hospital, when after my car accident, I can remember the charge nurse was Swedish. The nurse I saw most often uh, was Jamaican. The woman who was cleaning the floor was Italian. And that's in 1960. So when, when did I have the accident? 60. 63, 1963. 
So, you know, this is not new. This has been like a powerful force in our national culture that this is the way we've proceeded. And here is somebody, you know, who took billions, billions of our money to fail to do what she was asked to do and having the cheek to, as it were, spurn this incredible bank of, help, bank of work that has kept us alive, has kept us going. Um, you know, what finer thing can you do than to create a service that is about caring for each other? I mean, I've spoken about this, I mean, as it happens in a completely different context. I've, I've done a, a book about what happened to my relatives during the war. And the person who was interviewing me made the very good point that you don't want to leave children with a sense of disaster, sort of despair in talking about something like the Holocaust. And he said, well, what would you say to them? And I said, well, I've just, I've just been very ill. And that's actually taught me an incredible sense of hope because I saw at first hand what happens when people cooperate for the human race, for the betterment of all through care and love and attention, uh, attention to detail, to dashing in and saving people, you know, in my case, uh, but also, you know, when people fall over and, you know, break a leg and have it not as serious, you know, that at all levels. And as it happens, my parents were people who fought very hard for the national health to happen. Uh, I was born in 1946, so two years before the national health came in. Um, so it's, it's immensely important that, um, and really it gives us a hope that human beings can behave in that way. And here she was, you know, cutting right through it, something that was united and is united. I've seen it with my eyes, seen the wards, seen it all. And here she was splitting it and saying, effectively, here's us lot over here and here's all them foreigners over there. And we don't really want them anymore. I mean, that's, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. She didn't say that, but uh, that's effectively. And so somehow or other, what was that supposed to do? Play me, me as a white person. Was I supposed to see I'm born in this country and go, yeah, that's right. Yeah, get rid of them. Yeah, let's let's have let's have the whole NHS, you know, with with just British people, white people. Is that what she was trying to do? Dog whistle like that? I mean, maybe she would say no. She wasn't meaning that. Maybe she just meant, you know, bit by bit we would replace or something. But I mean, all that talk of replacement. I mean, that in itself is a whole ideology. That you know, the whole idea of the so-called replacement theory in Europe, you know, that the far right talks about that there's been this terrible conspiracy to change the, the European culture and replace it with people from outside Europe, all this stuff. And so we must work against the replacement theory. That's where it comes from, you know. And of course, you know, we, we, we know this has all kinds of racist and fascistic origins, this way of talking, and it's, it's revolting. And the idea that, of course, nobody in government seemed to slap her down for it. I mean, sorry, that was the wrong expression, but nobody seemed to say, um, sorry, that's not appropriate. You're a public figure. We're relying on you to be delivering this test trace and isolate. You're failing to do that. It's cost us 37 billion pounds. Why are you saying this divisive rubbish? How dare you? How dare you? Nobody said, I did, where, where, you know, where, where, what did Matt Hancock, what did Boris Johnson say? You know, they, they didn't say that. And it seems extraordinary that this happened in, you know, a year or well, more than a year when we have um, seen so much care from the NHS. Um, and what I love and what my children love about your work, Michael, is that you deal with political topics in your poetry, things like immigration and fascism, and you make difficult things and render them accessible for children and young people. And now with this international health crisis, the harrowing year we've spent, millions lost, in light of social injustices and inequalities foregrounded by Black Lives Matter, how do we explain this to children and young people? And the importance, I guess, of stories and representation in stories as well. I mean, is that where you think we can build greater empathy and, and, and tolerance and this coming together to collectively care and look after each other and society? Stories are a great way to do that. I mean, I, I was brought up in a family that did explain those things um, through story, through personal story of their own lives, because my parents were persecuted in the 1930s and described what it was like to oppose that and how dangerous it was. They lived in the East End of London. And so they 
constantly told stories like that, but also they were great believers in story. You know, my, I can remember my father, we used to go camping, and re my father reading Great Expectations to us, Charles Dickens' Great Expectations in the tent at night by under the light of a, a little lamp. And the more I think about the fact he did that, is in actual fact, he is Pip in that book. So people who know that book, he is the boy from that very poor background who then one way or another started to get better. The, the, the characters that he that in the book that Pip thinks are helping him, I don't want to spoil the story, who he thinks are helping him. My dad had somebody like that, his uncle Leslie Sunshine, would you believe, who was equivalent to Mr. Pumblechook or indeed Miss Habersham. Um, and then found out at sort of later in life that really it had all come from his dear mother who couldn't work because she'd had polio. Um, and in fact, she was in a way, though she was his mother, she was also the Magwitch character in Great Expectations. And so I can see him reading that story. And it is so much about our sort of journey through society, if you like, um, full of its hopes and despairs and disappointments and so on. And um, story can do that. A story can give us empathy. Yes, it can, because we're invited to walk in the shoes of others. I mean, that's, it's not me saying that. Or Philip Pullman describes it as the, the character holds your hand, or maybe the narrator does, either or both. They take you through into these terrifying and wonderful and dangerous places, and they're holding your hand, is the way Philip puts it. Provides and a form of care, essentially. Yeah. It is, because, yeah. you know the way psychologists have referred to story as containment, not in a horrible way, but that the story contains our feelings. So let's say I have a feeling of um, fear. I have a feeling of fear of something, whatever it is. And then I read a story in which somebody experiences fear. Let's say it's the Odyssey and it's Odysseus who's experiencing fear. For a while, Odysseus is doing that for me. I'm using that metaphorically. So what happens is it's not my fear. He's doing it. So he's taking the load. He's containing my fears. And then how he responds, in a way, part of me is thinking, hey, oh, that's interesting. Oh, you were scared. Well, yeah, I know what that's like. Yeah. And so we can, as it were, negotiate with the, the characters we're reading about in poem, stories, drama, film, song. We can negotiate with that, feel it for us. So there's a sense that these people are doing it for us. So there is a way in which writing, for those of us who are writers, we are caring for people out there doing the reading because we're showing them things. We're showing them things about feelings, ideas across the whole range and people can be safe. It's, you know, you've just, you've just got a book or just got a film. There is a way in which in, so sometimes you hear slightly puritanical people talking about these things as if they're, they're the danger. No, no, the danger is not in the, it's not the film that is the danger, it's life that is dangerous. The film it is the, about the safest thing. I mean, all right, there's images and so on we can all talk about, but the point is the, these things, these stories, they contain us. It's, it's, some people have used the image of a bowl, that you're in a bowl and it's containing you. Yeah. And I think that, actually responds to a question we've had from the audience. So I'm going to turn to the questions now. Um, you write, Michael, your hands speak, touch is a language. But during the pandemic, we've so often been separated from our loved ones, not able to hug, to touch each other. But I noticed that you took some comfort from music, even in a coma. What role do the arts have in care, do you think? How can poetry help us to create new forms of contact? Yes, I mean, obviously, uh, for coming from me, he, Michael would say this, wouldn't he? I would say this, wouldn't I? It is that I believe that the arts are one of the ways in which we can understand, interpret, investigate the world, find out what matters to us, uh, and also get sense of who we are in our groups, or indeed to reach out beyond our groups, to other groups so we can understand uh, each other across the kind of boundaries that people like Dido, um, Dido Harding, is it? Uh, I tried not to remember her name. Um, Dido Harding put up, puts up. So at the very moment she puts up the barrier, I know I can read poems 
and stories and watch films by the very people who she's saying, well, we get rid of them by the NHS. They're in my book. They're in another beautiful book called These Are the Hands that in actual fact, Dr. Katie edited, uh, which is out now. These are the hands. I don't want to pull down the shelf here. Um, and uh, and uh, and uh, indeed, people like John Agard, who I've learned so much from, and others. Um, so we can reach out with this stuff. So yes, there is a sense in which we use the word "touch," don't we? We say that play touched me. I was touched by it. And uh, of course, it's no substitute for the physical touch and the physical hugging that w we could do before. Um, but you know, it's it's a bit do, make do and mend a bit at the moment. And the arts are, is, are wonderful. You know, my daughter yesterday went to an exhibition, uh, a kind of light art, light, light sort of installations and lights yesterday, and she brought it all back on her mobile phone. And it was wonderful. She, I could see the people walking about in these light installations. And of course, in a way, lights, they touch you, don't they? And uh, I felt very jealous. I just suddenly thought, envious, I should say. I thought, wow, God, I wish I could go to that and, and see that some of the lights were flat and they, they were cross sections of the human body and things like that and it seems such a wonderful exhibition and I was I just thought oh I'd like to go to that and uh, actually um, Emma has booked us seats at uh, Under Milkwood next week so oh, uh, so that's rather lovely that we're going to be able to go and see that uh, next week so that's very much a kind of um, well it's sort of a very whole isn't it because you know that's what she sent in for me to listen to and I remember saying to somebody as I was coming round at some point in that week or two, saying, oh, I love this. I love this so much. In fact, I wrote about it, didn't I, in the book? I said, I love this so much. I wish I could write like that. <laughs> um, and so there we are. We're going to go, go to the National and I, shall, I will sit there. And part of the time I'll be loving it. And another part of the time I'll be going, oh, I wish I could write like that. <laughs> <laughs> we have another question. Um, and it's a political one. I would love to know your feelings, Michael, about the clapping. There's the, uh, I thought it was the name of a band first, but then I got it. There's the hypocrisy of the government clapping while cutting nurses' conditions, but then we as people want to show them all our gratitude. Eek. How do you feel about the clapping? Yes. In fact, I think I heard the first clapping outside our house when I was ill. So I think the first clapping, and I remember Emma saying she was going out to join in and me feeling very moved by that and thinking how nice that is. Um, I was upstairs lying in bed um, and then I gathered it, it kind of went on. And then I think when I came home, so this would be about four months later, and then, you know, out came this government offer, I put that in inverted commas, of 1%, which in actual fact, of course, is a pay cut. Um, it's, it's horrifying. I mean, it is, it is appalling. You know, that, in, and also totally unjustifiable. You know, we've seen that um, economies like Britain's, uh, I mean, it can be exaggerated, but it, this whole idea that there's a purse and that you can't take out money unless there's, you can't spend money unless there's money in the purse. This is not how um, a, a country that makes its own currency operates. There hasn't been that kind of economy in this country since we went off the gold standard. Basically, people create money by sitting at keyboards, making money, literally making money. That's how it's done. And then the government, in order to have spending power, just tells the Bank of England to press some keys. I mean, it's ridiculous. So these are political choices that the government makes. I mean, everyone talks about, oh, the terrible debt, the terrible debt. Well, you know, the, who's, who's clamoring for it to be paid back? It's, it's fine, Nobody, nobody's bothered. You know, obviously there are some dangers in terms about inflation and so on that people talk about, but and even that can be managed. But the idea that, you know, people like Dido Harding walk off with 37 billion for not doing what she was asked to do, and nurses have been doing way beyond that, that over a thousand health workers have died because of the pandemic. And don't start me on whether there was negligence as to how come this pandemic got in and all the rest of it. So don't start me on that one. Herd immunity, please. Um, and at the end of it all, they, they get a smack in the face like that. It's horrifying. I mean, I, if I could do more, I would. I've been asked to speak at a rally on, on the 3rd of July. Um, I'm a bit cautious about sort of going out and doing this stuff, but um, I, I will try to, and I do try to support 
all those campaigns that are, that are doing it. By the way, here's the book. Uh, it's called These Are the Hands after my poem. And you'll see it's edited by, there we are, Deborah Alma and Dr. Katie Emile, the woman who saved my life. So there we are. Well, that's wonderful. And we're very grateful to her. And your experience of COVID, I guess, you know, having found its way into your writing and just thinking about this conversation about care in the time of COVID, what lessons do you hope that we as a society can learn from this pandemic about care as a concept? Care is a kind of cooperation. And for me, cooperation is, a, is essential. It's, it's as essential as blood to our being that we have to cooperate. Human society, even, even at the time of war, is in actual fact there are other people cooperating. It is how we proceed. But obviously war is a disaster because it destroys us. So while one lot are cooperating over there, another lot are cooperating over there in order then to fight against each other. So that's the kind of the worst result. But what we have to have are cooperations at all levels in society, and that is care. I mean, a bit like the, my, the manifesto that my German farmer, I mean, you know, what a dream to have, you know, and it is a dream. It's my version of uh, MLK, isn't it? If Martin Luther King, that, that you know, it's, <laughs> I had a dream and it was in my dream. Um, and it is our only hope. Otherwise, we will destroy ourselves. We will destroy ourselves either through the whole climate debacle or we'll destroy ourselves before that in the creations of divisions and enmities um, on the basis of totally irrelevant and spurious ideas about who is the other. You know, we had the whole experience and we're still experiencing it, that Europe is the other. Um, and I, I'm, you know, and I'm not raising the issue of whether we're pro-Brexit or anti-Brexit, but part of, the, of the, the discourse, the dialogue was the idea that this place of Europe is separate from us and that therefore we must look with suspicion upon the other. And then we have the whole business of um, how, as we keep coming back to Dido, but of course she's no exception, and the whole uh, resentment of the fact that uh, people of colour, African-Americans in particular, raised the matter of, they were saying, black lives matter. They weren't saying it matters more than other people. They were saying, hey, we matter as much as anybody else. If you are murdering us on the streets, through the instruments of the state, then we don't matter. So we'll say black lives do matter. And, you know, that seemed a totally honorable and wonderful thing to be saying. It wasn't saying, you know, people said oh, white lives matter too. Hang on a minute, you missed the point. They're saying we don't matter is the effect of what's happening to us and has happened to us. And indeed in this country, people could say, look at Windrush. These are British citizens who came here on the understanding that they were getting work and they did work and the children came on their passports or they, you know, whatever. And then they were told that they weren't, you know, and it, 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 outrageous way to divide people. And, you know, the government and the rest of it, they should have held their heads, hang their heads in shame, a way of treating people who, you know, are in there under their protection. These are British citizens. That's how they came to this country. So these divisions are awful. And of course, again, reveal lack of care. So for me, as I say, cooperation is crucial. I saw it myself if I hadn't seen it before in schools and in my work, you know, universities and so on. Um, and then seeing it so excruciatingly wonderful in hospital. And that's a model. We can use that instead of rubbishing it and saying, oh, can we nibble away? Can we sell off that bit? Oh, wouldn't it be great if we could sell off intensive care? Oh, no, we won't make a profit out of that. Oh, I tell you what, let's sell off that ward over there. You know, all this stuff. We've got, a, we had a beautiful model. It's already being sold off bits of it. Um, uh, we had this wonderful model. We, we still could have. Um, and it's a model of care through cooperation, which uh, for me is um, heaven on earth. Yeah, I love that. Care through cooperation. And the idea of solidarity as well it affects me because it affects you 
uh, solidarity and allyship, I think, is also a form of care. And we've been seeing more and more of that. Um, Michael, I could talk all night, <laughs> but it's Friday night. And I know that's takeaway night for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so before we finish, uh, what's on your cultural radar that is making you happy right now? Uh, I like watching movies um, with Emma. Um, we watched The Last Picture Show, is it called? The Last Picture Show. Uh, old film, 1971. Um, really moving film. That sort of, and so I, I get, find myself quite moved by movies. It's great they're called movies, isn't it? Um, so that's nice. Um, walking about is great, because uh, I can and I do. So I had a little walk about today. Um, and got new a new pair of glasses in order to uh, enable me to sort of see in the middle distance. I'm going to show show off my glasses now. Oh, look. Oh, look at those. Uh, in fact, yeah, I should have worn them through because you see, I, I see double like, like that. I sort of see fog and doubleness, but I put these on, they're kind of magic. So I had a whole session with the hospital optician who I didn't mention uh, before. Um, and uh, so, yes, Mrs. Patel, uh, the, the optician. Um, and yeah, these, these I've just I just got them only about an hour or two, well, a bit more than that, about four hours ago. So uh, you're you're getting a, a you know this is a first show. This is of the glasses. So I'm very, in fact, you're very bright, Sandy. Oh, you, goodness me, <laughs> you're glowing. I had no idea. I'm sorry. Yes. Ah, well, yes. I think we should end on that point of happiness. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Your stories run glowing. Beautiful. Yes. Well, thank you so much. Uh, your words feature in so many of our homes here and across the world. I'm so grateful, really grateful for this conversation. And I hope it spurs our audience to go buy or borrow the book, Many Different Kinds of Love. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank um, you. Thank you, Sandeep, for your very, very generous and thoughtful uh, questions and introduction. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both so much. That was wonderfully thought provoking and moving and very full of care. Thank you, Michael, for sharing so expressively and generously. We couldn't have wished for a more inspiring or appropriate beginning to our summer school, so thank you again. Um, tonight's event is just the start of a fantastic lineup of free public events taking place every evening next week, exploring care in the Anthropocene, care and waiting, interspecies care, care and freedom, and troubling care. Our speakers include Raymond Antrobus, Marion Coots, Sean Hewitt, Barnu Kapil, Astrida Nymanis, and Maggie Nelson. And for more details of all of this, including how you can join us, please go to the website at www.criticalpoetics.co.uk forward slash summer. I'd like to thank our partners, Nottingham Contemporary, Curated and Created at NTU, and Metronome, who kindly provided technical support for this evening. Thanks, Jake. Michael's books related to this event are available via the Five Leaves Bookshop, Nottingham's wonderful independent bookseller. So to find out more um, how, to, how to get hold of them, please see the details in the YouTube event description. Thank you again, Michael and Sandeep. Thank you all for joining us and good night. <laughs>